Now I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thank you to Pastor Rod and, and Jadra. Uh, this is my wife Natalie, right with me. Yeah, Natalie. This is Natalie. My kids, that's John, John right over here. I think my daughter's in the back. Hopefully we're getting got into serious trouble. But before uh, before I say some of my story, and I don't know how much of my story I'm going to say um, right now. It's uh, one of my favorite authors says, our confession of his faithfulness is God's chosen agency to bring people into the church. It's our story. Our story is extremely important. Each one of us has a story. And I was, I was super blessed to hear the stories this morning. And I just opened up while I was listening to this, uh, this story in John chapter 4. And many of you know this story. It's the woman, the Samaritan woman that Jesus comes across. And he kind of just lays it, her whole life in front of her. And she's shook. And uh, she goes back to the town. And because of what Jesus has done for her and explained all this stuff for her, she goes back to the town and she's so excited. And this is what, this is what the Bible says in verse 39 of chapter 4 of the book of John. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And they stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. So Desmond, your story, someone will hear your story, they will come to the truth of what Jesus has done for them, and then it won't be your story anymore, it will be their story. That's how this whole thing works. Amen. Your story changes other people's lives. And my story is pretty much the story of humanity. And it isn't... See, I had a misunderstanding of the gospel. Sometimes we believe that the gospel is a, a behavior modification system. It's here to, to get us to, to live right. And uh, that can't be true. Because if it was... Well, let's, tr let's see what it, what, what it actually is. Let's, if you want to turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, and it's just going to set up our situation. It's going to tell us what's happened. And, uh, yeah, I'll give you a second to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 1 says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. If this was a behavior modification system, that would be like me happening upon somebody who has had a heart attack and is lying dead on the side of the road, and I get a book about healthy living and diet and bend down and have them read that book. That doesn't make any sense. They're dead. All of the health habits in the whole world will not help them at that point. What needs to happen? Well, they need to become alive. And that is what the story of the gospel is. It's you were once dead. Now Jesus. Now you are alive. And we all have different versions of what our death looked like. And um, you don't really know your death is, is the problem. You're a zombie. You're walking around and, and you don't know what's going on. But you have a spirit of disobedience in you. Uh, I love my kids. They're, 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 they're wonderful. But they've got a spirit of disobedience in them. <laughs> they do. When I say, don't do this, son... Uh, something makes him want to do that thing. This is, uh, this is broken down in, in the book of Romans chapter 7 where he breaks this down when, when we get a rule and it doesn't feel good and we kind of want to push up against this rule and uh, Paul explains what has happened to that and maybe we'll go into that a little later but that was the spirit that I was, was living in. I didn't want to be that way but guess what? I was, I was born into that. And... Um, it, I, 
I was born, and uh, it didn't take too long until I was playing in the sandbox, and somebody came for the toy that I didn't even want to play with at the time, but then I saw them going for that toy, and I reached for that toy, and I said, mine. And my mom didn't teach me that. She didn't teach me to be selfish. And then later on, she was uh, feeding me, and I said, no! And she didn't teach me to yell at her. But because of one man's sin, sin entered the world and through sin, death. So I was born into this thing, right? I, I was born and I hadn't sinned yet, but I was born into sin. Everything we've ever gotten in life is from birth. You were born into sin, yet you hadn't sinned, but you were born into sin. Why? Because of one man's sin, sin entered the world and through sin, death. You were born into it. Jesus explains this problem to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And what does he say? Well, you got to be born again. Because the first one, you were born into Adam. Now you got to be born again. There's a second Adam. His name is Jesus. So you are now, because you believe in Jesus, you are born into righteousness. But it isn't because of your righteous works that you were born into righteousness. It was Jesus' righteousness righteousness that you were born into. So like I said, everything in your life is from birth. You were born into sin, but you hadn't sinned, but you were just born into it. And then you were born into righteousness, but it wasn't because of your righteous works that you were born into. It was Jesus' righteous works. Amen. But just, be, just like you were born into sin, and you participated in that, you were in sin. Now you are righteous. You are righteous. Amen. Yes. Not because of your righteous works, but because Jesus Christ showed up every single day. Perfect. Every single day perfect. And he was on the cross and he was hanging on the cross and he looked. And even there, the, the people that he had healed, that he would walked with three years, just preaching all this stuff that they didn't really understand. And he's, and he's hanging up there and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And a friend of mine kind of broke that down to me a couple days ago and said, Richard, Jesus was hanging up there and when he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they were doing. You could also say that he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know that they are loved. And it's very, it's one thing for me to be up here and say God loves you. And it's a completely other thing for you to be loved by God. It's a completely other thing to be loved by God, and I'll tell you why. Because there's things in the way. There's things in the way. They're called lies. Lies. Shame is in the way. Because you believe a certain thing about yourself, and that certain thing is blocking God from loving you because you say, how can God love me? I've done this, 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 and this. And so that thing is in the way. It's like you, you look in the mirror and, and, and you see this totality of who you are. Even if you believe in Jesus, this happens. You still, you see these lies. Because I'll tell you what, the enemy is not powerful. He's not. And, and even if he is a little powerful, then he that is in me is stronger than he that is in the world. So then, then, then we have power. So the enemy is not powerful, but what he is, is a liar. He's a liar. And he doesn't counterfeit $1 bills, he counterfeits $100 bills. He makes the big lies. So just as Jesus became sin and he didn't know any sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ, he says, those to the, he says this to people who believe in Christ. He says, yeah, well, you're not righteous. Look at what you've done. Look at what... Look what Look at this behavior is in your life. Look at this over here. Look at that over here. And we're sitting there and we're like, yeah, okay. Well, I, I want to be righteous. And, uh, but I'm unworthy. I'm this. I'm that. And, and we, we have this, this gospel that says, I'm, oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this? And we walk around like that and we're just, we consider ourselves this thing that our Father in Heaven does not consider us. But, and, and we think that's good. We think that's humility. Where our Father has come to show us what He has thought about us all along. And uh, one of my favorite verses just breaks it down. It says, it's right here in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ 
with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. How do you know if you're in Christ? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? 1 John 4, 15 says, If you believe that, He is in you and you are in Him. So in Christ, because you're in Christ, because you believe in Him, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Well, what if I don't feel that? What if I don't feel like I have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? What does feeling have to do with anything? Preach. Sometimes I felt that God wasn't near. Did that mean God wasn't near? I think we could all say that we've sometime, some point in our life felt that God wasn't near. Was God far at that time? Let me ask you this. How far is in? Because if you believe in Jesus, you are in Him and He is in you. So how far is in? So even though I felt like He was far, was He far? No. So it says that I've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Even as He chose me before the foundation of the world, that I should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined me to adoption to Himself through Jesus according to the purpose of His will. Amen. This was before the foundation of the world. So this was before Adam ate the fruit. So before the foundation of the world, He thought about me. He thought about you. He thought about you. He thought we were such a good idea and now we're here. And the way He sees us is from before Adam ate the fruit. Because He created us in His image, where His image bears. And who is He? He's love. He created us to be loved and to love. But along the way, something was lost. And even when we come to Jesus and where it's found, we still fall into these lies because of our feelings. And so this is my story is I was born into a family that loved the Lord, that Adventist ministers go back in my family, my uncles, my grandfather, Adventist ministers. My, my, my father became an, a Seventh-day Adventist at, I think, age 18. And so I, I come from a strong, strong Christian background. And uh, my parents raised me the right way. And I was gonna, I was gonna do it, and I was gonna do the right thing, and I was gonna, I was gonna be a success because look at how I was raised, look at what they taught me, and I would look at other people and I'm like, ah man, they don't get it. That's too bad. I'm glad I get it. That's too bad. Good luck. And uh, everything would be going all right until it wasn't going all right. Until I did something that I didn't want to do. Whether it was looking at something I shouldn't be looking at. Or whether it was being angry or saying something I shouldn't say. And so whenever that would happen, I would, I would say, man, Richard, you're not, you're not like that, man. That's not, that's not who you should be. So uh, how are you going to get that out of your life? Oh, what are you going to do to get that out of your life? Well, um, pray really hard. And... and Ask God to take it away from you. Okay, that's what you'll do. Pray really hard. Ask God and He'll take it away. So I would try that. And then there would be some success and I would start feeling pretty good again. And I would look at the people that were, you know, struggling with the thing that I was struggling with just a few weeks before. And I'm like, ah, they should have prayed about it. They should have tried hard. Because I, I sure have prayed about it and I tried hard. And look at me and then feeling pretty good about myself. And then, oh, it happened again. And I would go back and I would say, oh man, I did it again. And God, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that thing. And I would, oh man, I, I just want to, I don't want to do that. And I feel pretty bad about it. And I thought, I thought the worst I would feel that maybe God would see me and say, oh, okay, he feels, he feels bad enough. We have this weird thing that we think that God wants us to feel bad so that we, uh, we really understand what we did. And the reason we think like this is because that's how we think. It's not because of how God thinks. It's because how we think. So like, let's say our spouse does something and hurts our feelings and our spouse asks for forgiveness. 
but they don't really like look like they're really feeling bad about what they did or said. And so that we can't really forgive them because, well, they didn't, they don't look like they feel bad enough. I'm like, babe, you really hurt my feelings. Well, I'm sorry. Well, it doesn't seem like you're really sorry. You, you need to act sorry. You need to act sadder. And so then when they get real sad, and maybe, maybe, maybe they will feel sadder if I guilt them a little bit. If I shame them a little bit. I can't believe you said that to me. How could you say that to me? I love you. How could you do that to me? And, and you, you, at some point, I, I did not only wanted people to think that the thing they did was bad. I wanted, to think, I wanted them to think that they were bad. And maybe if they think that they are bad, they'll feel so bad and the shame will change them. This is not how God thinks. Because if God thought that way, He would be working against Himself. And I want, I want you to understand this thing. If you ever try to shame or guilt somebody into changing, it will never actually change them. It will actually, maybe, it, it works in the short term very effectively. And parents, you know this, and let's stop doing it. But you can look at your kid and you say, how could you do that? And immediately the kid will stop doing that thing because you're, you're getting on them. But will that actually change their, their, what they, their heart? No. It will cause resentment. Later on, they'll be upset with you and they'll be frustrated with you because it is actually the kindness of God that draws repentance. It's not the shame of God. It's not the guilt trip of God. Because guilt, condemnation, and shame have never come from God. And I want to say that guilt, condemnation, and shame are never coming from God. It's coming from the enemy. Why? Because guilt says that you're not forgiven. You were forgiven 2,000 years ago. He nailed all of your sins to the cross. That's past, present, and future sins. Because all of those sins were future sins when he died. Because he died 2,000 years ago, and I was born in 1983. So all of my sins were future sins, and they're all forgiven, and they're all nailed to the cross. So if you're feeling guilty, it means that you don't believe you're forgiven. You are forgiven. It's done. You're forgiven, past, present, future, so there should be no guilt. Shame says that you're the thing that you did. No. You are not the thing that you did. You're not your worst behavior. You're a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. You are not your mistake. That is not your identity. And condemnation would allow you to believe that your life is able to be judged. But Jesus says to, to the Pharisees in John chapter 5 that our lives aren't even able to be judged because we've already gone from death to life. There is no condemnation for us because we are in Christ. What is there to condemn us? The law does not condemn us because we are not under the law. So there is nothing to condemn us. So guilt, condemnation, and shame has nothing to do with the life of a Christian. We're never supposed to feel guilty. If you mess up, you have an advocate, Christ the righteous. Now there's a difference between feeling guilty and godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is, Father, I was not living in the way that you that you have given me, allowed me to live. And I went back to former ignorance. Thank you that I don't have to live that way. Okay. Godly sorrow is there. Repentance. And then you don't just, you don't live with it. It's over. It's gone. It's in the ocean. But this is how we, we have been taught in the wrong house. And so we think that shaming somebody is actually going to change them. Is shaming somebody going to change them? No. Is it going to change them? No. So let's stop doing it. God didn't do it to us. It was the kindness of God that drew us to repentance. But that's, what I, that's how I used to live. And you know why I would shame somebody change them? Because that's what I thought God was doing to me. That's what I thought God was doing to me. I thought, one day I'm going to get busted. And people are going to see who I really am behind closed doors. And that shame will be enough to change me and to get me to go the other way. Guess what? That, not, that would not have worked. If I would have, if what of my sins that I would have done in the dark, if they would have been brought to the light and I would have been so embarrassed, it would not have changed me. It would have made me angry and resentful and I probably would have just gone deeper. After, after a quick, oh God, I'm so sorry, I'm embarrassed, forgive me. And then I would have gone further deeper because of the resentment that I have for God because I would be believing that He was shaming me. But we just covered that He's not shaming me. Okay, he's saying, hey, 
I love you. And I created you in my image. And my image is love. And let me tell you what I've done through Jesus. I've reconciled myself to you through Jesus. Amen. So this is what I was doing. And it manifested itself the most, I would say, in my marriage. Because uh, I thought, and maybe I can admit this. If you can't admit this out loud, maybe just think about it. I thought if she would just listen to me, uh, we could just figure this thing out finally. If, if she would just listen to me. When I would go to church and I would hear a sermon and the, and the pastor was preaching, I would think, man, if my wife would just listen to this, then uh, we wouldn't have any problems. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to speak kind of strong. If you think when you're listening to Pastor Rod preach a sermon, you think it's about your wife, it's about you. If you think it's about your husband, it's about you. Okay, this is about us. Let's... Uh, Let's figure out what's going on with ourselves. Let's figure out where our heart is. Let's figure out what's going on so that we can actually love somebody. Okay, so that's what I thought though. I thought, oh, if, if she would just listen to me. And you know what? I really thought that I loved my wife. I really thought that I did. And I wanted to. But my love wasn't, I, I was still seeking my own. I would put her first if it was convenient for me. But oftentimes I would put myself first. And I didn't want to admit this because, you know, if you admit, no one raises their hand and is like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty selfish. Or I'm, I'm pretty self-centered. And uh, if she would accuse me of being that, I would argue with her and say, no, 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 that's not the case. You just don't understand this and you don't understand that and you hurt my feelings and you... And I was keeping record of wrong. I was seeking my own. I did not lay my life down, even though I promised to do all of those things. So maybe I really cared for my wife. But I realized, I realized that after, after seeing all this, that I didn't love her because I needed her. And I don't need my wife now. I love her. And when people hear me say, I don't need my wife. They're like, oh, you don't need your wife. How can you say that? Well, if I need my wife to, to live, then my hope and my peace and my joy is in my wife. So if something happens, if she doesn't think well of me, then my life will be destroyed and I'll, I'll, I'll crumble. It, if you need somebody to be okay, they're Lord. Hear what I'm saying. Some of us have put our spouse on the throne and they are Lord and whatever they think about us can make us or break us. And that, that truth is realer than what, what this thing says. And so if she would get on me, I just, oh, it would kill me and I'd be so, it would hurt me. And so I was a hurt person and I would try to love but because I was so hurt, I would keep record of wrongs. And I would... Yeah. I didn't love. And it's, it's... Sometimes people hear me say, Man, you didn't love your wife. Why, why are you telling us that you didn't love your wife? I wanted to. But if you are not loved, you can't love. Amen. If you're reaching back to love somebody, like to get the love, that, and, and there's nothing there. Now, did God love me? Yes. But men died for a lack of knowledge. I didn't understand. Because if you don't understand how He's loved you and what He's done, then you might want to love God and you might want to be loved by God, but if you don't understand it, it's not a real thing for you. And so one day, I'm going along and my wife will, she'll say that, and she would have said this back then, that we didn't have a good marriage. But I would never admit that because I, you can't admit defeat and there's pride there. And, and so three years ago, if you would have said, hey, how's your marriage? I would have been like, oh, you know, we're growing and we're getting better and things are going, you know, there's speed bumps, but God's showing us this and he's showing us that and, you know, and yeah, yeah. And uh, if you would have asked my wife, I don't know what she would have said. Um, 
But that's how I was going along, and, and I would have all these strategies to defeat the things that I was struggling with, uh, the things that I was looking at from time to time that I knew good and well I shouldn't be looking at, so I had all these strategies, and the strategies, you know, they were working out because I was committed, because I had, a, I had a good heart. I didn't want these things to be a part of my life, but yet they were still a part of my life, so I had the strategies. And after a while, I'd been, been going really well with these strategies, and then as high up as I, I would get... Because the strategies were working, it would be as low as I would go when they, when they, when they didn't work. And the, the righteous man falls seven times and he gets up. And so this was my strategy to just keep going. And then one day, and I think, I don't know how long I've been going. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up right here and then later on we'll, we'll go on. But then one day, I had a thought that scared me to death. And I had never considered stepping out on my marriage or doing something that stupid. Even though Jesus breaks it down and he's like, um, the law says don't commit adultery, but I say don't even do any of this other stuff. And that didn't really make sense to me. I'm like, oh, that's kind of impossible. But, so I had this weird thing going on, but I thought, well, I've never actually considered it. And one day, because I felt like people really loved me and I was doing a good job at whatever job I was doing and I was getting praise from people but I wasn't getting praise from the person that was Lord of my life my wife she was sitting on the throne and she wasn't praising me and so I thought I started feeling bad for myself and I'll tell you what as a Christian there's no room to feel bad for yourself ever no room to feel bad for yourself as a Christian because we've been given everything God doesn't owe you anything because he's given you everything. God doesn't owe you anything. He's given you everything. But if you don't understand that he's given you everything, then he owes you something. That's right. And so I started going down in this spiral of feeling sorry for myself. And there's no end to feeling sorry for yourself. So I started feeling sorry for myself. Man, she doesn't she doesn't treat me the way I should be treated, and she doesn't do this, and she doesn't. That's called self-centeredness. Because if you don't love your life unto death, it's not about you, and now you can actually love. But that's, that's actually following what Jesus said. So I'm sitting there feeling bad for myself, and the stock comes in, and I'm like, oh, I bet, I bet. And I went too far with the I bet. I bet I could. And I thought, oh my goodness. And that scared me to death. I'm like, I would never... I would never do something like that. I'm, I'm from a Christian home. I'm from a Seventh-day Adventist Christian home. We, we go to church on the right day. How could, I consider, how could I consider doing this thing? And I, that week I traveled up and I met up with a buddy of mine who was having real struggles in his marriage. But something was going on in his life, and I'll explain that a little later. But something was going on in his life that his circumstances had stopped determining his joy a long time ago. Jesus was now determining his joy Amen. and not his circumstance. And I was looking at this guy, I'm like, man, what is going on with this guy? And I said, hey, man, I've got to tell you something. He's like, what's up? I was like, I, I need to put this into the light so it loses its power. He's like, well, go ahead. And I told him the situation and the thought that I had. And he said to me, Richard, don't you know that that doesn't have any power on me? And I said, well, then why am I telling you about it, bro? Obviously, it has power over me. If it didn't have power over me, I wouldn't be telling you about it. But it does have power over me. And he said, no, man, sin doesn't actually have any power over you. And I said, uh, then why am I telling you about this? And then we went back over this thing, and he's like, Richard, sin, sin's power has been destroyed. And... I'm just arguing with this guy. I'm arguing. And why, the reason why I was arguing with him is because I'm eight years older than him. I've always been the mentor in our relationship, and he's always been the mentee. I've always been talking to him about relationships and marriage, even though mine wasn't going very well. But, you know, he didn't really know that. So I'm, I'm the guy that's supposed to know all this stuff. And I realized that I was spiritually proud that I couldn't learn from anybody. And I'm learning all this in this conversation because what he's telling me, because I don't understand it, and I'm supposed to understand more than he does, it's not, it's not landing, it's not sticking with me. And for some self-help book I read a while ago said that if you 
don't believe somebody that you're not actually listening to them. You're actually waiting for them to stop talking so you can tell them that they're wrong and you can show them how they're wrong and while they're talking, you're coming up with the different reasons why they're wrong. So you're actually not listening to what they're saying, you're just fault finding and finding where they're wrong. And that thought came to me in that moment and I said, maybe I should start listening to this person. So I started listening and he said, Richard, what is your relationship to sin? I said, what is my relationship to sin? And I started thinking, well, I haven't really been looking at the things that I shouldn't be looking at for a while. But I did have this thought over here. And I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. And then he said, Richard, when it comes to righteousness, you're not on a journey. You're at the destination. And I was like, what? He's like, when it comes to righteousness... You're not on a journey. You're at the destination. And my wheels start turning in my mind. What is he saying? And he said, Richard, why are you righteous? So I start thinking, i got to get the right answer, right? Why am I righteous? And I came up with the right answer. Uh, well, because of Jesus. I have Jesus' righteousness. He's like, yeah. And when did he do that? Well, at the cross. You're like, yeah, you believe in him, right? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, so how? So are you going to get more righteous than Jesus' righteousness? Mm. And I was like, um, I guess not. <laughs> and it started sinking in that maybe I didn't understand this thing very well. And he said, let's go to Romans chapter 6. Okay. Well, we went to Romans chapter 6, and the first verse in chapter 6 is a verse that should give us a lot of comfort because we worried about people uh, understanding the gospel and going and doing whatever they want. But Paul says, should we sin now that we're under grace? Of course not. So apparently Paul was dealing with the same stuff that we've been dealing with for the last uh, 2,000 years. And so I was like, huh. Then he goes through, and the, book, the chapter of Romans 6 is an explanation of what Jesus has done to sin, and now what our experiences and our relationship to sin is now that we're in Him. And in verse 7, I'll just read it so you don't, you don't think it's just me coming over this. Romans 6 breaks down baptism. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, this is verse 3, that were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism in death, into death, in order that just Christ, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might too walk in newness of life. Okay, this sounds good. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. And I used to think, a resurrection like this, well, this must be talking about end times. Well, let's find out what it's actually talking about. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So, we were crucified so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Okay, that makes sense. That one day we will not be enslaved to sin. Maybe when Jesus comes back, we will not. Okay. Then verse 7. For one who has died has been set free from sin. It's like, Richard, have you died with Christ? I was like, I think so. He's like, well, when were you baptized? Uh, 1995 I was baptized. Like, do you know that when you went into the water, you were participating in his death? And then when you came out of the water, you rose with newness of life? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. oh, I'm like, okay. Well, maybe. It's like, and so it says, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Okay. Um, then we went to verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Wow. I must consider myself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And this is where 
I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. The next, we talked about it, and I didn't understand Romans 6 very well. I just understood one thing, that I am dead to sin. I'm free from it. I shouldn't consider myself alive to that, but alive to God. That I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I'm a slave to righteousness, and it's through His holiness. Amen. I didn't really understand all of that, but the next day I just woke up and I'm like, I'm righteous. I'm not righteous because of my righteous works. I'm righteous because of Jesus' righteous works. And that began the journey of me understanding what the gospel is. A declaration of what has happened. This is not a current event. This is news of something that took place 2,000 years ago. It's not like an option. It's the state of what has happened in, in our world. And we can either decide to get with it or die. And so that has transformed and changed my life. And I guess if you want to hang out a little bit with us this afternoon, we'll, we'll talk more about it. And um, that's my testimony just to start off today. Thanks for, for listening.